Hey guys, before we get started, I wanted to thank the sponsor of this video, Tipsy Sake. Tipsy Sake is an awesome subscription service that is on a mission to try and change our perception of sake outside of Japan. You see, although sake is one of the most popular and historic types of alcohol in Japan, outside of Japan it remains largely a mystery drink to much of the world. Tipsy Sake wants to fix this by providing you with shipments of assorted sake selections straight from Japan. And as a sake connoisseur myself, I can confirm that this service is an amazing offer. One that can not only help people new to sake try it out, but also help people already familiar with sake find amazing new types to enjoy. Each box comes with a carefully curated assortment of 6 bottles from a selection of over 400, with also booklets and reference cards to help you fully explore not only the crafting of sake itself, but also help familiarize yourself with the actual brands of the bottles you receive. There is so much fantastic detail here put into the assortment you get that I have to commend them. As someone who already loves sake, a service like Tipsy Sake is such a great way to deepen one's appreciation of sake itself. Down below I will leave a link to where you can get your very own sake assortment from Tipsy Sake. And also, you can use the promo code SHOGUNATE to receive 10% off on all products, or SHOGUNATE30 for $30 off your first sake box. This really is a fantastic service and I highly recommend it to anyone who already loves sake or is interested in trying it out. Just please remember to obey your country's laws on the purchasing of alcohol and please drink responsibly. So with that said, Let's get on to the video. In the past, we have covered some of the interesting forms of samurai weaponry. From the iconic swords of the samurai to the matchlock firearms that would become popular throughout the Sengoku period. Yet one weapon type that I have largely been wanting to cover is that of spears and polearms. Weapons with longer reaches that could be utilized in a variety of ways. These longer shafted weapons were actually the most commonly used among samurai and ashigaru throughout the warring ages of pre-modern Japan, something that pop culture and pop history has largely forgotten as people's fascination with swords like the katana have taken so much attention away. In reality, throughout much of Japanese history it was spears and polearms that really were the most common weapon type used in battles and it is the evolution of these weapons that I want to explore here today. Not only in how these weapons themselves evolved, but also how their actual usage changed over the years as well. Now, it should go without saying that this video, like my other evolution and overview videos, does not seek to cover every minute detail, but rather just go through the overall history of these weapons and how they were used. So, with that said, let's start out by going back as far as we can. Like most forms of Japanese armor and weapons, early Japanese spears have origins rooted in the mainland, as it is believed that one of the earliest Japanese spear designs, the Hoko or Hoko Yari, which may have appeared as early as the Yayoi period, was inspired heavily by contemporary Chinese spears. These spears would initially be made with bronze, but would later in time incorporate iron and steel as well. The Hoko is fascinating because its inception predates the samurai class, and was even known to be used alongside that of a shield at times, characteristics that are not often seen when visualizing what would later evolve into samurai warfare. The Hoko is believed to have been mainly a thrusting weapon, as the design of its head did not really allow for slashing motions. This would eventually lead to the rise in popularity of another design, which could indeed both stab and slash. This of course being the famous Naginata, which first came to appear during the Heian period. The Naginata polearm, which also gets called a glaive, was different from its predecessor, being that its blade was much longer and allowed for more versatility in use. It would become a staple weapon of the samurai for hundreds of years, up until the early parts of the Muromachi period. Being used by both mounted and foot soldiers, it was the main weapon used by almost all forms of melee combat. This is an important point to make, because we can see early on that although Japanese sword technology was too advancing around this time, the main staple of close quarters warfare was heavily determined by the Naginata. By the late 12th century, the Naginata came into its height, as it was frequently used during the legendary conflict that would come to be known as the Genpei War, which had been the largest samurai conflict up until that point, 
and in the aftermath would leave Japan firmly in the hands of the warrior class for roughly the next seven centuries. Although the naginata has a distinctive shape, you can also look deeper to see that there were many different variations of the actual type of blade used. One of the earliest and often seen as the most popular design depicted in artwork is that of the Tomoe Gata Naginata, with the name itself believed to perhaps be a reference to the historic figure of Tomoe Gozin, a famous female warrior who is said to have fought in the Genpei War. This design was broad and incorporated a heavy curve, making it ideal for cutting motions more so than any stabbing. It saw major usage during the Heian and Kamakura period before the rise in popularity of another design, the Shizuka Gata, which arose in the mid-Kamakura period and would continue to flourish into the Muramachi period. This design was slimmer, straighter, and thus longer. Their added reach and versatility became more desirable, which paved the way towards their increased usage. And although there are more designs we could get into regarding the Naginata, it is this gradual change that helps to illustrate the general changing trend of melee weaponry in Japan. Following the Mongol invasions of Japan in the late 1200s, warfare in Japan was going through a massive change, as foot soldiers became much more significant, and with this, the weapons they wielded began to change. During the years of the Nanboku Cho period, a conflict between two rival competing imperial courts led to the rise in usage of longer bladed infantry weapons. Through this, we see the spread of such weapons as the Nodachi, an extremely long bladed sword, and the Nagamaki, which while considered a sword as well, can be seen as sort of a cross between that of a sword and a Naginata. These long weapons, the Naginata, Nodachi, and Nagamaki were each useful in their own way. And with the increased role of infantry engagements, soldiers on foot could not only engage one another with them, but also stand a better chance of taking a rider off of his horse should he engage with cavalry. However, it should also be remembered that while for the most part I am referencing all these weapons being used on foot, they were each known to have also been utilized on horseback as well. These weapons all had their time and place. Yet once again, returning to the ever-shifting face of warfare moving throughout the Muramachi period, they would each eventually come to be largely replaced by what would become the most popular of Japanese long-reaching weapons. The most famous type of Japanese spear that would arise, the Yari. The shape and design of the typical Yari spear is believed to have originated during the 14th century and would in time come to surpass all of its long-reaching counterparts. At first, its design was not favored over the Naginata, and has even been called the poor man's pike, but in time, its qualities would come to shine. It incorporated a shorter blade than that of the Naginata, and was often double-sided, meaning that it could still both stab and slash. This also made it ideal for attaching it to longer shafts that could be used as pikes by mass formations of infantry, creating a wall of pointed blades that could not be achieved by the shorter and curved naginata. But one thing that often gets overlooked as well is its simplicity. As if damage occurred to either the blade or shaft, either piece could quickly be replaced. This meant that mass production would have been simple and more suitable for the chaos of the growing trend of ground warfare in Japan. The rise of this form of ground warfare also coincided with the rise of the Ashigaru, common foot soldiers who could be easily armed and drilled with the simple Yari. And by the outbreak of the Onin War, these groups of what can be considered pikemen had become the main backbone to any samurai army. It was an innovation that is believed to have been made by the Hatakayama clan, who began incorporating this new formation into their battle tactics. It would be an idea that would catch on and quickly spread due to its usefulness, as large masses of Yari-armed Ashigaru in time became the main staple of warfare in Japan. Now, that does not mean that the Naginata was phased out entirely, as it still saw heavy usage by other groups. Specifically, it was still seen to be a popular weapon among groups of militant warrior monks, as well as female warriors who took up the duty of protecting strongholds during desperate times. But in terms of just samurai and ashigaru, and the general trend of Japanese warfare, the Yari was quickly becoming the most used. This rapidly evolving face of samurai warfare can even be viewed statistically by number of wounds attributed by weapons classified as pikes, which during the 14th century in Japan is thought to only have accounted for 2% of all close quarters combat wounds. 
they would go on to cause 80% of all such wounds from 1467 to 1600 throughout the majority of Japan's Warring States period, the Sengoku Jidai. Through this, we can truly understand that although so often pop culture has led us to believe that swords were the main weapons of the samurai, in reality, it is obvious that the Yari Spear was the real main melee weapon of samurai warfare at its height. And while in many cases we can see it to be the main melee weapon used by both samurai and ashigaru on foot, it also became the main weapon used by riders on horseback. Swords in Japanese warfare came to be more used as just a backup should a samurai lose or break his spear in the heat of battle, or for specifically close quarters engagements that the yari was too long for. But it is here, before we move on, that I would like to briefly cover the anatomy of a typical yari, the weapon that had really by the 1500s become the face of samurai warfare. Let's first start out with the haft or shaft of the yari spear itself. This part is often simply called A. It was made of either wood or bamboo, and depending on if the yari was either serving the role of a spear or a larger pike, the shaft could measure anywhere from 1 to 6 meters. It was fitted with additional metal collars and sleeves, such as the kuchigane, sawaka, dogane, chidome dogane, nakadogane, and mizugeshi. At the top, of course, was the blade, known commonly as ho, which came up to a tip known as hosaki and down to a throat known as shiokubi. While at the opposite end, the butt of the shaft was fitted with a ishizuki endcap. Like swords, the blade was often protected with a sheath called saya. Now, although this is a typical and simple yari design, which can often be considered a su yari, it would be wrong to assume that all yari took this form, as actually there were many different unique styles made for different purposes. One popular design was that of the kamayari, which had one additional jutting blade that reached out from the side. This was not only extremely useful at catching vulnerable parts of enemies, such as the neck or limbs, but also very good at lodging into enemies on horseback and dismounting them. This is similar to another popular design known as the Jumonji Yari, which had two additional blades that formed a cross shape. This design became heavily used during the end of the Sengoku period and into the early Edo period. It should be noted that designs like this were also good at catching and deflecting other incoming blades, yet some Yari would even just simply enough be fitted with hooks for the same purpose. There are a wide variety of other types of yari that would arise, with some resembling crescents, large leaves, large hooks, and even just some with super long blades. The list goes on and on as craftsmen continued to explore the range and usage of many different designs suitable for different purposes. Some of these shapes even cause the yari to appear akin to that of a European halberd, which the naginata is often compared to as well yet they are generally considered to be different entities and should not be mixed up. Yet all of these different forms of yari also become more fascinating when we attempt to picture their usage. Initially, you might be inclined to believe that, like other spears and polearms, the yari would have just been used in formation to stab and hack. And while obviously this is true, one of the primary ways it has been said they were used, and even depicted as such, was in a way of raising them high and then drawing them down over an enemy's head. Almost as if one was trying to hammer at the enemy. To be honest, I have no idea to what degree the yari was utilized in this sense, besides from what I have heard in a presentation and seen depicted. But it does for sure give a more solid idea for the shape and usage of many of these yari styles. Now, from the 1560s onward is what I truly consider to be the height and real apex of samurai warfare. By this point, western-style firearms were becoming increasingly common across all of Japan, and in just 15 years, Oda Nobunaga would come to have a massive impact with his usage of them at Nagashino, taking tactics he had witnessed by other enemies and using them to grand effect. This ushered in a unique era of pike and shot warfare in Japan, where masses of foot soldiers in groups armed with matchlocks and yari took center stage. Yet cavalry was still utilized as well, not only as shock cavalry for flanking, but also for riding down fleeing foes. But of course, with the end of the warring era in Japan, around the year 1615, came the end of the golden age of the yari. 
As we enter into the peaceful Edo period, usage of the Yari was sidelined for shorter weapons such as the katana. Yet legends of master spearmen from the past warring era kept the Yari alive within the samurai class, as many samurai continued to train with it through the spear martial art of sojutsu, not entirely different from naginata jutsu too, which continued on. Spears and polearms would make a brief resurgence during the Boshin War, when the age of the samurai came to an end. But of course, although the samurai faded from history, their martial arts lived on, and continue to be practiced to this very day. Now, like I mentioned, there is plenty more I could dive into here, specifically in terms of things like different variations and more depth regarding formations themselves, all of which I hope we will get to in future videos. For me, the history of spear and polearm usage in Japan is extremely interesting, mostly because it has become so overlooked by the pop culture image of the samurai and pre-modern Japanese warfare, being that the spear was really the main melee weapon used by the samurai, not the fabled katana like a lot of films and games would have you believe. And although the sword was still an obviously integral part of samurai culture both before the Edo period and especially into the Edo period, its height in usage did not really occur before that point. And to further that, I have also equally noticed that when samurai spears and polearms are included in media, they are almost always just the naginata, despite the fact that the yari had succeeded it during the apex of samurai warfare. This is all information that needs to become more relevant in our collective image of the samurai, and hopefully in the years to come we will see this truth depicted more frequently. It is something that is very integral to our understanding of the samurai, because during the turbulent years of war in pre-modern Japan, the evolution of the spear is one that coincides with the evolution of Japanese warfare itself. I want to once again thank Tipsy Sake for sponsoring this video. Please consider checking them out if you are interested in exploring more about the fascinating world of sake. Links down below. Yet with that said, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.